Welcome back to Building a Fighter. My name is Dr. Austin Shane, sports chiropractor in Scottsdale, Arizona. With me, as always, badass strength coach in Denver, Colorado, Alex Friedman. Today, we just want to do a little talk about why wrestlers in general need strength and conditioning. Um, emphasis on the strength aspect of the strength and conditioning, because wrestling is a lot of conditioning. Right. Um, and also how we structure the conditioning to benefit our athletes and not just run gassers until they puke. So Alex, as a topic mm. that you are passionate about, take it away. <laughs> yeah, man. Like wrestling is a, is an inherently grueling sport and you're not going to get very far without really good conditioning <laughs> or without an adequate level of strength for your body weight, right? Like you weigh in relative strength is your moneymaker. Yeah. Um, but that being said, Strictly wrestling will get you part of the way there, right? If you wrestle a lot and you're moving somebody else that weighs a similar amount as you, you're going to get strong in certain aspects and you're going to develop a lot of what's called like muscle endurance, mm -hmm. right? Or um, I don't know, I wouldn't even, maybe a little strength endurance. But what we're going to miss out of all of that is your super maximal loads, your uh, like one rep max absolute strength. When you don't hit that, the relative strength stuff never gets easier, right? So one of the ways that I look at, and it's called like a strength reserve, or some people call it a speed reserve, but you can apply it to strength as well. When I increase my one rep max in strength, let's say I can deadlift 200 pounds, okay? And I wrestle in the, you know, 125 division, mm -hmm. right? If I'm wrestling somebody that weighs 125 pounds and I lift them over my head or I do a mat return, that's going to take, you know, let's say that's what, 60% effort right? 125 over 200 ish. Um, <clears throat> if I hit my deadlifts, I'm on a regimented strength conditioning plan and I can, now I can deadlift, let's say 300 pounds. And then I go to do that reverse lift or that mat return to the other 125 pounder again. Now I'm only, I'm using less than I'm using 40% effort, right? So that, that increases my efficiency within my wrestling technique so that I can keep doing the optimal technique at a higher intensity for longer. Right. Ironically, I call that strength efficiency. Sure. Strength which efficiency. is what it is. Right. Um, Go ahead. Well, I was, I was just going to say like, that's, I have a cool case of that is an anecdote. <laughs> I have Hunter Azure. Um, he's on to the ultimate fight and the new ultimate fighter show, but it, he's a strong motherfucker and he's a high level wrestler as well. Like he was a four-time Montana state champ, high level wrestler. And on top of all of this, he, he always feels strong, but sometimes he gets beat in certain positions. So he got back from, from the show and we've just been working while the show's going on, um, and getting him strong, getting him ready. And so he just before the, he left for the show was at a three twenty five three rep max trap bar deadlift. This was what, four and a half months ago, five months ago we just finished our last phase of, it was basically just absolute strength work, just getting him strong as fuck to get him ready and build up. And we did a, we did a rep out. We did an AMRAP at the end and he repped out at 365. So 40 pounds above what his three rep max was. Nonetheless, 10 straight reps of form. Perfect. Like the functional yeah. capacity trap bar deadlifts with yeah. no elevation. And that can't be coincidence that I've also had four of my other fighters that are in his weight class say, what the fuck is Hunter doing right now? He feels like a brick. <laughs> and it's not like he's put on a lot of weight. He's still walking around around 158, 160, right around there, like a perfect range for a Bantamweight. Right. Like, he's just fucking like a – he's a brick. He's like I, – I equate that. It's almost like you're trying to wrestle fucking Kirby from Super Smash Bros. When he jumps up into the air and he drops down like a stone – uh, and you can't move him. That's basically what it feels like when he sprawls on you or when he's in a double leg, you just can't yeah. move him. Oh, yeah. And what that concept is, is he didn't put on any size. He's the same weight, but his strength efficiency went up. The movements that he was doing before are easier for him to adapt to and easier for him to dominate in because he got stronger in that position. hundred percent, you know, and, and the, the positions that we select can be very wrestling centric, right? We can mm -hmm. select a trap bar deadlift, which is exactly like, you know, picking up a double. We can pick a split squat, which is like shooting. We can um, do like a kettlebell swing, which helps your hip pop, right? There's there's definitely a tricep push down, like, or 
or a lap pullover. Like there's a lot of movements that mirror what you're doing in a wrestling match period. Right. And we can work backwards biomechanically from there to look at these are the positions you're weak in in wrestling. These are the positions we're going to train some strength in. Like that's an absolutely valid arena. Now, what I think wrestlers hesitate with in the, the world of strength training is the I'm not working hard principle. Right? Yeah. So can you it's explain a bunch that of a bull- it's, well, it's just a bunch of bullshit. I mean, it's it's it purely comes down to you want to do what you're good at. And wrestlers are good at grinding. They're good mm-hmm. at putting their nose in the dirt and working their ass off. And they get praised for that at all points in time. No matter what, if you work hard in wrestling, you're going to get rewarded, whether it's with a win or whether it's with a coach's admiration, like you're going to get rewarded for your hard work. The shitty thing about doing proper strength work for a wrestler is that you need to take breaks. You need to allow yourself time to recover in between. And that same kind of like almost like that pump that you get from strength work and heavy fucking lifting isn't the same type of burn that you feel when you are wrestling. So it doesn't feel like you are working hard. It doesn't feel like you're maximally exerting your body. And most of that is purely because most wrestlers are weak as fuck. Like they're not strong. People think they're strong because they're kind of cut and everything. That's mostly just from being able to wrestle, being able to do your sport over and over again. That like physique that you're getting is just the demands of your sport. They're not actually super strong individuals. So they don't know how to maximally express the quality that is strength. So when they get in and they do, or they I'll, here's the stereotypical example for a wrestler. They can go and do a 225 pound trap bar deadlift for 20 reps. But if you put it up at 285, they can do two. Right. Like th- they have such a high capacity and such a low floor or such a low ceiling for strength that it seems like they can do all this weight all this time. They can just fucking run through shit, but they can't actu- actually maximally express their strength. Where in reality, if you can do 225 for 20, you should be able to fucking pull trap bar deadlift. I mean, if I'm doing my math right, that's about a 385, three rep max. Like, like you, you should be able to pull a fuck ton more weight. They just don't know how to express that because they won't put in the mental effort to try to get better at that because it's not what they're good at. So, and uh, sorry, I'm going on a tangent here, but, and it's perpetuated by skill coaches that come from an old school background and they say, oh, we, we don't need to fucking lift weights. Why, why would you need to lift weights to wrestle? Like you're lifting a body all the time. That's, a, that's good enough. That might be cool. And guess what? This is going to be blasphemy. But if Dan Gable was wrestling his weight, cl- Bo Nickel, Dan Gable would get fucking murdered. <laughs> like that old school mentality might have worked in the olden days. And that's totally fine. And I respect the fuck out of that. But just like Chuck Liddell would get fucked up by Israel Adesanya and nobody would argue that Dan Gable would get fucked up by Bo Nickel. So this whole, oh, you only need to wrestle because that's what we used to do mentality doesn't apply at all because the sport has evolved. Athletes are better. We see it in every sport, not just wrestling, not just combat sports. The skill level has gone up and the barrier of entry for physicality has also gone up. You need to have some sort of regimented strength and conditioning routine if you want to compete at the top level. You yeah. don't if you want to be average. If, you, if you're if you an extremely skilled individual and you don't care about winning a national championship, you don't care about going to the national tournament, and you're just fine being a, a starter at a D1, D2, D3 university, and that's fine, fuck it. You don't, you don't need that. But if you want to win, if you want to be the best, if you want to try to win as many matches as possible – you do in this day and age need some sort of regimented strength and conditioning routine that has been put together by a professional, not just a skill coach that doesn't yeah. necessarily know the variables. Yeah. Not your high school coach either. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. I I, I, no, I love it. I love it. And I, I totally agree that the need is there, right? Like I think that's blatantly obvious for us to see um, where I can see that it doesn't match up for wrestling or wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Right. We talk about we have the capacity in wrestling. We have so much capacity. We have so much capacity. We don't have the ability to express maximal strength, which I totally agree with. Um, 
the I think one of the honey holes or the traps the wrestlers get into is they get really good at expressing that strength in a wrestling context. Yeah. Right. So when I when I'm wrestling and I grab the wrist or I have wrist control, it's gonna feel like I'm as strong as a motherfucker because I've I've drilled that wrist control. I know the exact leverage points. I know how to to grip that so that I can maintain control there. If I can express my my capacity and my let's say sub maximal strength on the wrestling mat really well, and how does that mean that I'm deficient if I can't express maximal strength, right? Because like essentially what I'm asking, if I'm gonna deadlift four hundred pounds, right, and I need I work up to my capacity to do that and I try my best, right? What what's the benefit of that on a wrestling mat? Right, like I can't express a four hundred pound deadlift. How do I express a four hundred pound deadlift when I'm wrestling a hundred seventy pound dude? I couldn't tell if that was rhetorical, but I'm going to answer. Um, so, how I equate this to, I'm going to use another anecdote to equate this to. This is like the business owner that I talk to when, whenever people uh, people ask me for questions about shit. And this is the business owner that says, "Oh, look at everything I'm doing. I haven't had to market. I've done this all without marketing." I don't, I don't have to do any sort of internet marketing. I don't have to do any sort of like in-person networking because it's just word of mouth. And they all get so proud of it. Same thing with wrestlers. You all get so proud. Man, I feel so fucking strong when I grab a wrist. I can do this position. And I feel like Superman when I can get my wrist control. Why do I need to lift? I feel strong. That's fucking cool. What I say to those business owners is, that's awesome. Now imagine if you did do the thing that we know is proven to work. <clears throat> like imagine if you did do marketing, you'd have more people and you'd be making more money. You'd be helping more people. Same thing for the wrestler. Just because you feel strong there doesn't mean you're not leaving shit on the table. We know this thing works. We have, it's, it's not like strength and conditioning is five years old anymore. Like this is a 70 year old field, 80 year old field now for the most part. And the good research is right around 50 years old. While we don't have everything ironed out, we got some pretty good shit to show that getting strong is going to play a benefit into your sport. Yeah. Being properly conditioned, not just running fucking gassers up and down and giving no break in between, is yeah. going to play a benefit in your sport. So what I say to those people is, guess what? Just because you did this well without it doesn't mean you can't get better with it. And when you run into a buzzsaw, like, uh, like say you got to go wrestle. Like I remember the first time I ever wrestled somebody that I felt helpless was, was Corey Clark ended up being a uh, national champ at Iowa. And I just felt like I felt helpless man was stronger than me. Man was better than me. I was eighth grade and he beat the living shit out of me. And I was like, Whoa, I thought I was strong until that point. I thought I didn't have to lift weights. Honestly, this was what made me realize that I wasn't strong was cause that man fucking manhandled me. And then that flip, that switch flipped where I was like, Whoa, maybe I'm not, maybe there is something I can do. Maybe, maybe I can get stronger. Maybe I can get better. I can grab his wrist and he just rolled it like that. Maybe yeah. I should do some fucking grip work. Yeah, no, I get it. And I, I love that. I want to switch gears because, and, and not too far away, but the, the ability to express maximal strength. I totally agree that the wrestlers are lacking that one thing. I think that wrestlers lack even more and they're even less aware of is your ability to express maximal power, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and we don't think about power in a wrestling context because it's because um, wrestling is a very you know strength dominated sport and lactic grind type of sport. But you think of some of the best wrestlers in the world, like in my mind immediately goes to Jordan Burroughs yeah. and the ability that he has to explode through his double legs, right? Power can absolutely be a differentiator in a wrestling match, and so. The, that quick, short burst or that spurt or that throw or however we determine moving fast with a weight resistance, right? That has missed the ball 100% in any of our wrestling training, right? Like we don't work on any absolute power. And then I see, you know, wrestlers come in the, the weight room and we do something like a bra jump or a med ball lateral oh, throw. It's or, always so ugly. Or, <laughs> or heaven forbid we have our wrestlers try and do a power clip. Oof. Right, like it's just like that is a a missed category in our training of wrestlers where it really shouldn't be like like power. Like you think about finishing any t sort of takedown in an appropriate manner. You know, if I'm gonna windmill the legs off my double, if yep. I'm gonna try and explode through a blast double, 
if I think about, again, lifting somebody, period. It all has to happen with a quick burst. Like that's one of the the learning the lessons that I learned going through a freestyle Greco season this spring is a gut wrench works a million times better when you pop your hips through it rather than try and control it all the way through, right? Like, yeah. and, you know, brain exploded on my end. But the minute that I tried to – I was focusing so hard on teaching our wrestlers how to do a back arch and, like, roll through it, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh, just pop through it, and then yeah. you're going to get it in Drive and pop, time, drive and pop. Right? And then, Austin, you, you witnessed Aiden mess some kids up constantly. Oh, yeah, that kid crushed it. Aiden Vincent. So he, he again, gut wrench was his go-to. But the ability to express power. Like, why do we overlook power? I know we're not throwing punches. We're not throwing an implement. We're not doing this and that. But we can still work a ton of unilateral plyometrics. That is my go-to for wrestlers. Well, so plyometrics is key. And the difference is I feel like a lot of grappling sports in general, well, just combat sports in general, they they move towards the extrinsic plyometrics. They want to mm-hmm. jump rope. They want to do prolonged uh, like pogos. They want to they want to do things that are sustained, right? Where it's it's just the same endurance concept, where it's almost like a grindy way to do a fucking plyo. This is the shit that I'm good at. I'm gonna stay here. Exactly. Whereas we don't do the in or the extrinsic intrinsic or the intensive plyos. Intensive, that's yeah. Good. Yeah, I know. I was playing around with it in my head real quick. Uh, <laughs> intensive plyos where like you're doing maximal expression because guess what? Again, it comes down to stop being a bitch and do the shit you're bad at. <laughs> I know when I was a wrestler, my broad jumps looked ugly as fuck and they were really bad and I didn't yeah. like doing them and that made me not do them. Yeah. And guess what? I'm here to tell you that is part of the reason why I didn't get my, I didn't achieve the goals I wanted to achieve was because I only stuck to the things I was good at. I said, oh, you know what? I probably don't need those broad jumps. I'm not a power wrestler because I, I wasn't. I'm yeah. like, I don't need power. Why would I need that? I'm a scrambler. Guess what? Kyle Dake's a fucking scrambler. You know what he also is? Yeah. Powerful oh, as fuck. Power. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Like all, it, There's nothing that is going to be hindered if you get more powerful. Just like yeah. there is nothing that is going to be hindered if you get stronger. Everybody thinks, oh, your mobility is going to go down. If you do it the right way, the way that we're recommending and working with a strength coach, you maintain pliability as you gain strength. Okay, You're not just going to get stiff as a board, which is what, again, the older school coaches are kind of thinking. If you get strong, you're going to get stiff. That's just not necessarily the case. And we know that through a good amount of research. But the under, uh, the unfortunate thing is that research isn't always necessarily readily available or digestible. So it's up to us to try to get the word out and say, hey, motherfuckers, like wrestling isn't it. You have to do something else off the mat to get strong if you want to achieve your goals at the highest level. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, that's where I lean on some of my like sociology degree, but whatever. But like practice has to inform our research in a lot yeah. of contexts, right? You can't just rely on this is what the research says, so this is what I do. And I think that's even a turnoff to you know people in our field as well as wrestlers. So – I like that idea of kind of getting in the nitty gritty or being able to work on things that you're bad at, right? Like if I think about the highest level wrestlers, I think about them all as phenomenal athletes, right? Like think about the world's best wrestlers and they are great athletes, period. You know, that may not be their first thing. They've applied it to wrestling really well and now they become really good wrestlers, but it's not like I can't like Gable Stevenson is a phenomenal example. Dude's a freak. if I asked Gable Stevenson to go dunk a basketball, he's like, oh, easy. Okay, whatever. Right? Backflip to it. Backflips, all right? Like, he is a phenomenal athlete, and he's applied his talent and trade to wrestling super well, but he, he's a robust athlete, if we're going to use yeah. that word, right? Like, to get really high level, there is a definitely a minimum requisite of robustness. Yeah. You have to be a good athlete and be able to apply that to wrestling. You can't just be a wrestler, period. So I think that that robustness is absolutely worth pursuing in the weight room. Like that's one of the first thing I do with all of my, you know, if I get a high school wrestler, middle school wrestler, or anybody in the weight room, it's like, can you jump rope? (laughs) That is an athletic, you know, endeavor. Some kid, a lot of kids, you'd be surprised. A lot of kids cannot. So let's put the time in, let's put some rhythm and coordination, right? Because I think there's a, there's an underlying rhythm component of every sport that, 
goes above a lot of people's head. But like, can you put the rhythm and timing together to jump this rope? Okay, because that's going to help you with your um, rhythm and coordination and your stance and motion. That's going to help you feel when you're bouncy, when you're springy versus when you're flat footed, because so many wrestlers are flat footed. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that robustness category deserves its own merit as much as just the absolute strength or the absolute power of this, this whole idea of be a better athlete, period. And then you have more potential and better ability to transition that to wrestling. Right. Well, that's the whole point of strength and conditioning is to increase athleticism. Like there's a reason why all sports there's, there's what maybe a 10% difference between almost all sports and what you would do. Maybe 15. Right. Yeah. In strength in the strength and conditioning lens for the, oh, especially yeah. for the strength Where lens. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Like 85% of sport strength and conditioning wise is going to be extremely similar. You're going to use similar exercises. You're going to do similar modalities. You're, you have to build strength. You have to build power. You have to increase athleticism. That applies to every single sport. Yeah. It's not just wrestling specific. The entire reason why you do strength and, dis- and strength and conditioning is to become a better athlete. You need to be able to express your body in maximal ways. That's all strength and conditioning is, is trying to increase variables in your body. Now we need to apply it to our sport. And that's why it goes so well hand in hand with like, say if we're moving on, say we're getting into a competition. This isn't off season anymore. Like we, we have a a girl that's going to wrestle at final X. And so we're helping her with some conditioning and stuff like that. And we made sure I'm not going to focus on the bad parts anymore. Right. When, when, when we're close to competition, we're not just going to focus on the bad shit. Let's do the stuff you're fucking good at and make you better at that. Right. That is also a strength and conditioning concept. And there's a time and a place for each. But that being said, strength and conditioning is still used in an efficient manner. It doesn't have to be all just lifting weight. While that is a main point of what wrestlers I think need is you need to get stronger and more powerful. Like Alex was saying as well. There's a time and a place to get better at the grinding as long as we do it the right way, as long as we're taking breaks in between. We're not just maximally overloading our system. Like so many coaches, I I see it time and time again, and it's almost like it's like a a fucking habit. That's why you do it is that, all right, step to the line. Practice is over. Let's do some fucking sprints. And you just sprint down and back. And there's no rest time in between. There's no, there's, you literally, you're with a partner and you're sprinting down and back and you're doing like a maximal 15 second sprint. And then 15 seconds later, you have to do another one. You're not going to be able to hit a hundred percent. That's not going to be any sort of power. That's just to grind you into the dust. That's more for your brain than anything. But that I think is a long way to say why I think coaches don't like skill coaches don't necessarily agree that strength and conditioning is always necessary. Because they see it as they, – they don't understand the differences in variables. They don't understand that you need X, Y, and Z, that there's a better way to do things. Yeah. It's almost like the information isn't out there for people to understand that that – what I was just explaining is not conditioning. That is mental conditioning at the best – at, at its sure. best. Sure, <laughs> like, right? and it's like time and place, right? Like I think there's there's definitely time and place to like make a wrestling room like a grueling place to be. But for sure, there are better ways to do it and, and with an understanding. And I think the information is out there. I just think it's communicated poorly in a lot of senses. And um, you have to want to seek it out. Right. You right. Can't, can't put that on the back burner. But there's kind of well, two places. hold on. But bef- what I want to say is before we move on, like y- you need to understand there is a time and a place to make it grueling. But do not say that's going to make their body better. Don't say that's going to improve their conditioning, which is what they mask it as. That's not going to improve their conditioning. That's not going to literally, that's going to hurt them, not help them from a physicality standpoint. What it is going to do is going to make them mentally tougher. And if that's your goal, fucking say that. But don't, don't say that that's going to be improving their conditioning when it is very much not going to be improving their conditioning because that's where the wires get crossed because they see that as the same thing as doing better condition, proper conditioning. And that's where I feel like the misunderstanding happens is they're like, Oh, we're already doing that. And they don't understand that that's not really conditioning. That's actually just mental shit. 
Right, and I definitely want to get back to that, and I think we'll let's let's circle around and finish with how to do that better. Right, that end of practice, I want to get a final push out of the guys. How can I do that in the best way possible? I think again, let's wrap around and finish with that. But the two places I wanted to go was you mentioned the difference between sports, like in a a strength and conditioning sense. If I'm training somebody for football versus I'm training them to be a high level wrestler, right? There's maybe like a fifteen percent variance yeah. right there. Right, the the program's going to look different. But it's going to look minimally different depending on certain variables of the sport, of the individual athlete in front of you, et cetera. So I want to hit best strength and conditioning modalities and uh, things you've seen the best results with working with wrestlers. What's that 15% comprised of? What can we put together for wrestlers? And then again, at the end, let's wrap up with how do we finish off practice with the extra conditioning that can be both meaningful as well as a little bit of a mental grind and push or how should we schematically put together our conditioning in the wrestling room? How can we put that together and make that make sense versus just let's get them dog tired and, and work yeah. so hard. So in that, maybe we'll do like a little top five thing. Um, best modalities in the weight room for wrestlers that you've seen and I can contribute some that I have as well. Uh, but what's your first one, Austin? Things that every wrestler should go do in the weight room. Um, I if we're talking like sport, like sports specific, that's what you're talking about. Like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna make a variable for a wrestler in specific, I sure. like as far as an implement, I like uh, Atlas sandbag cleans. Okay. If I'm gonna do, if I want to improve one of my wrestlers in specific, if I want to improve their power. I really like those heavy ass sandbag cleans because it's extremely similar to lifting dead weight of a body, like a straight lift in Greco. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it seems that I get buy in from the wrestlers because they, it makes sense in their head, which I feel like is most of the time an extremely underrated part oh, of programming yeah, is that you need the athlete to understand why they're doing it. So I, I really like those heavy sandbag cleans because it's a great way to get maximal power expression in a way that makes sense to a wrestler of any age. Hell yeah. Yeah, and going straight off of that, like the, the movements that make sense in wrestlers' heads, like I think that's a huge thing for buy-in, like you said, but that's also a huge thing for like for practicality, you know? We're not just going to do bilateral static strength, right? right. We need to... Yeah find some transition into sport and find some specificity. And the way I do that is with a B stance or a staggered stance, trap bar deadlift. Stole my next one. Hell Dick. yeah. I love that, dude, because <laughs> as much as a trap bar deadlift is valuable and we can do that out of our bilateral square stance, like just like essentially a square wrestling stance, that's going to be fine and, and dandy and well. And we're going to develop a lot of absolute strength from that. If I just make a little slight shift into a B stance, into like a staggered wrestling stance, um, I can bias one leg unilaterally. I can increase the amount of coordination it takes to express that maximal strength. And it makes sense to wrestle. Oh, this is a little bit like my stance. How can I be stronger in my stance? Right. Yep. And the more and more I get into coaching and the more and more I see kids lose matches because their stance is shitty. A hundred percent. But that I think has a lot of carryover and, and it's like, it's like a hairline piece closer to specificity but doesn't actually change that dynamic of absolute strength in a trap bar that lift 100 percent um my next one that for it's really all contact sports in general um would be neck strength mm -hmm. so the thing that i think inherently makes sense to wrestlers is if you get fucking clubbed and your head bobbles down guess what you're probably getting taken down so strengthening the neck a, it's, I think, I believe the statistic is every one pound of increase in neck strength decreases your risk of concussion by 3%. And obviously there's a drop off point, but I'm pretty sure that's the numbers right now is one pound of neck strength drops the probability of concussion by 3%, which is a fuck ton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and there's so many different ways to get creative with neck strength. Like I've been having people do neck bridges. You can do yoga ball X's and or a plus signs. You can do rotations. You can do uh, I, something I've been doing. I actually saw, I think her name was Becky Summers. She's one of the uh, strength coaches at the PI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we were out there for that course, I saw her doing it. And I was asking about it. She's doing like extensive plyos 
with a band around the athlete's neck. So it's isometrically loading the neck and almost it. So they're doing like lateral hops with a band, not around the hips, but around the neck. So you're isometrically loading the neck the entire time. So you're training in multiple planes. There's so many different ways to add neck strengthening in, and there's zero downside to it. As long as you're not just cranking out concentric, eccentric, fucking 90 pound neck extensions which is oh, yeah. just going to shred your discs. So don't that's do that, exactly, please. That, that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted to hit on, like the the uh, neck harnesses, right? Is they got like time and place, right? You can, if you're <laughs> if you're at zero pounds of neck strength, you need to do some concentric strengthening. But if we think about, like you said, what Becky was doing with the uh, extensive plyometrics with a band around the neck, how does your neck need to work in competition is yep. extremely reactive isometrically and eccentrically. Right? Yep. So that's the that's the ultimate goal, right? We can start general with our neck harness, concentric strength, and then majority of our time should be spent in the isometric and rapid eccentric mm-hmm. type of areas. And that's where the, the advent of the uh, iron neck and the some of the band resistance and manual resistance gets to be super valuable because you know your neck doesn't prevent concussions by like concentrically fighting against any type of force. Right. It prevents concussions by being able to rapidly respond with isometric strength that prevents you from getting snapped down. Right. right? Well, like, go ahead. and on top, well, on top of that, like the, one of the top three things I see with grapplers is disc herniations in your neck. As far as from the healthcare side of things, guess what makes disc herniations not happen in your neck? Strong necks. Mm-hmm. Because what is a disc herniation, right? Uh, most of the time a disc herniation, as long as it's not massively traumatic, is caused by too much movement in a segment. That means that is a lack of stability. Guess what strength is going to increase? Fucking stability. <laughs> so if we stabilize the neck, there is less. There is a less likely cascade of events that could go towards a neck disc herniation. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but if I had to play the odds, the stronger neck's not going to get herniated as much as the weaker neck. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, I'm going to take a twofer here um, in my next two Bitch. movements. Yeah, no, I'm just diving right in. A little bit more like relative strength or functional strength, quote unquote. Um, I think every wrestler should be really good at pull-ups and not just 40 body weight in a row push-ups, <laughs> pull-ups. Um, yeah. You need to add some variance with like a weight belt. Let's do that shit for some absolute strength. Let's add bands and do it for some speed. Dude, right? I love banded those... pull-ups. That shit's hard. There's a lot of different variables to play with and pull us, but I feel like everybody's like go to is just like, oh, I'm gonna rip out as many as I can and row this is strength endurance exercise. It's like not exclusively. Yeah. You know, like let's put some weight on there. Let's see how much weight you can pull up. Let's see how fast you can pull up, like which is such an underrated um skill and method of working pull ups is like let's see that rapid fire. Let's see a a med ball slam right after his pull up. So I was how just about to say that. Get out of my head. <laughs> <How about, laughs> like well, it's a perfect we're contrast we're set. Is a speed this. pull up right into a med ball slam. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to get some power on your snaps, there we are. Um, then also, for whatever reason, these two things are correlated in the same realm of um, strength training for me. But kettlebell swings, <laughs> right? How's Post your chain work, I guess. Sure. Well, kettlebell <laughs> swings are huge because. It gives us a foundation for hip extension and flexion, right? Like a hinge. You know, what is a hinge? I do it all the time in wrestling. I do mostly a rounded low back, but um, kettlebell swings can teach us a proper hinge and help us out with using our hips and posterior chain. But then there's also a rhythm component of like a pop and then stabilize, pop, stabilize. That's a double pull. Damn, you're all about this rhythm thing right now. I know. I'm on it. I think there's, uh, again, there's... A lot of under take up a dance class or something right that something like that. No, I just started hitting mitts and boxing, and (laughs) And you realize you're not athletic as athletic as you thought you were. There's a rhythm there that I've missed (laughs) for so long. Um, But yeah, I love the kettlebell swings for wrestling specific because we get some power in our hips, we get some body organization, right? Like, yeah, you don't typically think about body organization, but kettlebell swings can give you some power in that type of movement. I love how much kettlebell swings force you to use your feet too, which is an ex- another extremely underrated thing for grapplers is being able to use your foot, driving off of a foot, having an arch built, having your, what most people call tripod, I call it a quad pod and your four points of contact as you're going through movements. 
that can only set you up for success. And wrestling shoes in general aren't great for predisposing you for good foot loading. So getting it in different parts of your training is a great way to supplement that. Yep. Okay, last piece of modalities in the weight room for wrestlers, Austin, what you got? Fuck, you took a lot of them. Um, I'm going to stick with kettlebell swings, but in a different element sure. because we already have five. Um, I like kettlebell swings as a conditioning method to lead us into the next part. Sure. I think they're a great way to bring in a strength component to the conditioning that you're doing. So it's not just you're doing body weight exercises for conditioning. It's that you're not just overloading through the heart rate, like maximally, like we're doing strength based or technically it's a power, but a heavier movement in a way that we can still get a metabolic stimulus. So like we can do heavy single arm swings and we can do that in a, we'll say like a 20 second on 40 second off, uh, imp implement right there. And we're going to start working into the lactate system, but it is going to be any, as long as you have the prerequisite strength, which would be determined before we program this, mm -hmm. we know that that is going to benefit you in just as much, if not more of a way than throwing you on like an air bike for a 20 seconds on 40 second off spurt, right? Yeah. It's just going to hit you in a different way. And a lot of wrestling, I've been toying with this idea a lot, right, um, is we talked about this recently, peaking and peaking for the sport, not just peaking to peak. And wrestling, we know, is more of a strength speed sport, not necessarily a speed strength sport. So as I want to condition my athletes, I need to keep strength in mind. I need to make them as strong as possible in certain conditions. So we want to increase the strength variable, the strength speed mm -hmm. dynamic. Well, guess what? I can just overload. We can keep the same paradigm of, we'll say, 20, 40 for, well, fuck it, five reps per side. So it'll be 10 reps. That's going to be a shit ton. But it's a metabolic stimulus that is beneficial. We can just increase the weight of the bell every fucking week. We keep yeah. the same implement, but we're going to increase the weight of the bell. So we're going to overload the strength side of this equation or the load side of this equation, which is going to make them stronger in that sequence or in that metabolic pathway. And that what is what I really like about kettlebell swings. That's how I use them. Once my athletes know how to use a or to do a kettlebell swing efficiently, that's when I start playing with the conditioning element because I think it's an underrated mm -hmm. skill for teaching what Alex said, which is the double impulse and bracing and rigidity, but then also overloading and making them strong in a position that's extremely valuable. Right. And, and a lot of what you're explaining there is, is somewhat how I break down conditioning, especially when we get into like really the subtle nuances of it, or when we try and apply it to a sport like wrestling is all for me, all conditioning is, is you have two uh, variables that you're trying to match up, right? The duration piece, right? That's pretty simple. How long are you going to do this activity, right? You have duration. So you can do something for five seconds and call it conditioning. You do something for 50 minutes and call mm -hmm. it conditioning, right? They're, they're, that piece is relatively easy. The second variable is where we get in this super open territory, uh, wild, wild west, is the intensity piece. Yeah. How hard are you going to go for this duration? And we can measure, quote, unquote, intensity in a bunch of different ways. We can do mm -hmm. it with how heavy is the kettlebell. We can do it with how fast are you moving your body. We can do it with um, how complex is this exercise? Right. How hard is this for you to coordinate? Um, so the intensity piece has to match up with what we're training for. Like you said, wrestling is a little bit more of a strength speed sport. So we need more strength than we do speed. So if I'm looking at my intensity piece, a kettlebell swing, like you said, once you practice it, is a pretty um, easy modality. Mm -hmm. Right. So we can push the intensity on how much weight you're doing versus like if I have somebody doing power cleans. Right. That's an right. extremely complex movement. So I'm probably not going to put that into um, the same conditioning piece as a kettlebell swing. Damn. Don't let CrossFit hear that. Oh, God. <laughs> um, anyway. So going into your in practice conditioning. How do we manipulate these two variables of duration and intensity to best match with what you're doing at practice, right? So my first key point is Austin mentioned these like six to 10 second sprints that seem to purvey every wrestling room everywhere. It's like wall to wall, right? <laughs> Down and back. Wall to wall, right? 
those sprints, okay, and this is going to be a huge cultural shock for a lot of coaches, I'm sure, or athletes, those sprints are worth 10 to 100 times more if you do them first thing in practice than if you do them last thing. True. Right? Yeah. Because if we're talking about a maximal effort sprint for 6 to 10 seconds, that is super short on our durational side, super high on our intensity side because we're pushing maximal speed, right? Which for wrestlers isn't going to be that maximal, but we'll – delay that argument the only time you're going to hit maximal speed is when you're not in a fatigued state mm -hmm. right after wrestling practice when you've been wrestling live there is zero percent chance at, that you're going to run the fastest you've ever ran except when wrestlers are really bad at running but that's again delaying that argument so if we're wanting maximal speed maximal output from our sprints which is Strength and conditioning wise, the purpose of a six to ten second sprint, put that first thing in your practice. But don't you want them to be able to explode when they're tired, Alex? That <laughs> let's get into a different. You know how many right, times so I've heard you know how many times I've fucking heard coaches say that? <laughs> how do you actually train that, Austin? So so let's all right, let's table what I'm saying, right? The six to ten second sprint for maximal power, maximal speed output. Put that at the beginning of your practice. Start it off on like a high intensity day. That's a beautiful way to start your practice. Now, different practice, different context. We want our athletes to be able to explode when they're tired. The third period shot, I want it to be the same power as my first period. Yeah. How do you do that, Austin? How do you train that appropriately? Ooh. Well, I mean, there's so many different ways to do it, to be completely honest. Well, I mean, go through what you just sent me. Yeah. Uh, what you're sending to that guy. That's exactly how I would train um, what I might call like sprint repeat or foul yeah. endurance. Yeah. So w what I would do is I would train a, what I would do is technically called an explosive repeat method where you're going to start with a lower work interval and a higher rest interval, and then work your way over a period of time to a higher work interval and a lower rest interval. So typically it's anywhere between 15 to 20 seconds of work at the beginning to a 35 to 40 seconds of rest. And then you're going to work your way up to the inverse, which is going to get all the way up to 35 to 40 seconds of work with 15 to 20 seconds of rest. Notice how I didn't just start with 40 seconds of work and 20 seconds of rest, because there's no way that an athlete can do that unless they're a genetic specimen at the beginning and fully maximally express that variable, right? So an easy way to do this, if uh, my favorite conditioning element, which would be an air bike. Would you're just going to throw them on ex explosive repeats. We'll start at 15 seconds of work. You'll take 40 seconds off. We'll say 45 just for simplicity's sake because that would be 60 seconds. And then you're going to go up. It's going to go from 15, 45. That's going to then switch to 20, 30. Then it's going to inverse from there to 30, 20. And then it's going to inverse from there from 45 to 15. And this is an imperfect system because we know we're going to have to apply that to different athletes in different ways. Some athletes are not going to adapt as fast as other athletes in that situation. But we're going to do that from anywhere, typically for me, between five to eight reps, depending on how hard I want to push that athlete. Okay. No, but and I think this is a modality that you can put at the end of practice. Like, I don't, again, I'm we're not working in a maximal capacity or maximal right. Any, like well, oh, the, okay. Right? I, I didn't understand what you were trying to get me to say. I get it now. Lactate work. We can throw at the end because that's yeah, grindy. Right. That's, that is not necessary. We're not going to be able to maximally express that system. Yeah. And that we know there always is going to be a drop off yeah. when we're doing lactic work. If you can get full recovery on your lactic work, guess what? You can't fully express that system. That right. means it's not lactic work if there is no drop-off. Our goal with that is to try to make that drop-off as little as possible. Yeah. So yeah. we, when we know there's going to be a drop-off, we just need to track that process. So you could even stick with just straight-up 30-30s at the end if you want. If we want to get extremely simplistic about this, we can do 30-30s for four to six reps. And you just work on trying to make that wattage that you see at the top, the a, a power output that they have drop off less between their first rep and their last rep over the course of time. But we're not just going to have them go a six second sprint, turn around and do another six second sprint 15 seconds later. That's yeah. not the same energy system at all. 
and I promise if your athletes are giving any amount of effort to this, they will be in a grueling, hard, yeah. mentally, mentally tough place, right, when you finish this. So I think the, the lactic capacity work and, like you said, that explosion under fatigue will can be beneficially trained after practice. Um, but there's, like, two things I want to hit on the head with that, that that you articulate really well is, like, the rest intervals. We have to be – disciplined and strict on our rest intervals which typically for a lot of wrestling coaches in wrestling rooms means more yes. more rest uh, it right? al- always means more <laughs> yeah right like like all right the whole like find a new partner five four three two go right like yeah you know as much as we're pushing some intensity and some aerobic uh, adaptation or maybe a little lactic capacity adaptation that's not a specified conditioning amount of rest per se right right the more work we can do at a higher quality, higher quality typically means less fatigue, yeah. the better we're going to get, period. You know, like, you know, it's like swinging two bats constantly in baseball, and then you get to swing one bat, yeah. right? So if we're wrestling constantly under fatigue, we're swinging two bats all the freaking time, mm-hmm. right? Versus that's going to throw my swing off if I never practice swinging one bat. If I never practice training in a, in a rested state with all of my tools available, then I'm not going to be as good in that place. So um, add rest because it's going to get your athletes to perform at a higher level more consistently, which is what we want as coaches, period, right? Yeah, especially when we're like, I think you're alluding to this, but I want to say it. I'm yeah. talking about add rest in between your live go bouts. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so many people do, you'll do like three, a three minute go, and then you'll take 20 seconds off and go right into the next, like into the next go. Mm-hmm. And do you know, do you know how non-beneficial, I don't know if that's a word that actually is for that athlete. Right. They're immediately starting at a disadvantage and you're not going, if, if you're trying to get your athletes, your wrestlers to wrestle at their best, you want to see them try to go out there and, and, and do everything they possibly can to get better that day. Why are you setting them up for failure by not giving them a good rest in between goes? If you're doing it, again, if we're doing it for a mental toughness aspect of it, if we're doing it for up here, then that makes sense. But lead with that. If you're doing yeah. for it for them to become a better wrestler, for them to be better at the skills that you just taught them, you need to add in more rest so that that athlete feels ready for the next bout. Okay. They need to be ready to rock and roll or else you can't get mad when they look like shit in their fifth go. You really can't. You have no legs to stand on because you're the one that did that to them. And then you're going to say their conditioning sucks. When in reality, that's not even a stimulus that comes across in the sport. If we're on your fifth go, so that's 15 minutes of wrestling in and you're only getting 20 seconds to stick with the same paradigm. So you're getting 20 seconds. You're getting a two minutes of rest. When the fuck does that happen in wrestling? That's not even close. That athlete's conditioning yeah. is probably great. You just ground them into the dust because you didn't properly give them rest to let them go out there and do their thing. Yep, absolutely. And the last uh, piece that I want to kind of articulate about what you said and the protocol that you outlined, which I 100% agree with on the Airdyne, is like that is a perfect example of this like um, – peaking and tapering for the demands of the sport versus peaking and tapering period like peaking and tapering traditionally in a strength and conditioning sense would uh, would uh, necessitate the opposite of what you said where we go yeah. from a lot of capacity to the short capacity but in a sport like wrestling we're going to peak for the match we're not peaking so that you can be really powerful for one go or we're not peaking for this specific thing we're peaking for conditioning for the the demand of a seven to eight minute ten minute wrestling match however yeah. long it takes so that's why we would go from a, a high intensity or short durational to a long duration because we're enhancing and we're peaking for that conditioning, that energy system, not for uh, what is typically peak and taper for is like a track and field sense. Right. Um, so I think that's an entirely appropriate. The last piece I want to talk about about conditioning and, and how we can do serve your athletes better in that sense is like these team runs, the, the long, slow, durational type of aerobic system that we that everybody wants that everybody preaches and we need to grind for but nobody really articulates how and when and where and why we should do it right so with a let's say with a wrestler austin and maybe they're really skilled really talented but they've never taken time to establish an aerobic base 
in their training. How do we a develop that? And then once you get there, how do you maintain that? You mean every wrestler ever that <laughs> just wants to go in there and just run maximally nah, dude, at all points in time? Aerobic base. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, shut up. <laughs> once upon a time, I had a phenomenal aerobic base. Yeah. Well, so easiest way is get a hard strap. Um, if you don't want to spend the $70 on a hard strap, you can use a talk test and make sure that you're able to form like about a paragraph of talking without feeling overwhelmed or like you have to stop talking to the person next to you, but you're going to do start at 30 minutes of zone two work, which means low intensity work. Alex calls these LSD runs cause you got to be so high on LSD to make them fun. <laughs> um, but really it it's, also sounds for long, slow and durational condition. True. Not as fun. Um, so you, you want to start at like 30 ish minutes and you want to be able to work up in intervals of anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes. So you get to around 75 to 90 minutes is what they say. I get bored as fuck at that range. Um, and while some people have more mental fortitude than me, I think that 60 to 75 minute range is, is pretty damn good. Um, I'd recommend this twice a week. So doing 60 to 90 minutes at the top end twice a week is a great way to try to build a more robust system. So you're going to increase what's called left left ventricular hypertrophy. What that means, it's going to allow your heart to actually push more blood and more oxygen out. And it is going to allow you to actually have a more robust aerobic base and get more nutrients through the system in a faster setting. Man, I completely agree with that. I think if we can isolate like a pre-competition or pre-season phase or something that we know is, you know, six to nine months away, yep. right? If we have super strict control over our schedule that way, which is not common in an MMA world, maybe common in like a co collegiate wrestling world, um, I like a higher frequency than that. I like three to four to five times a week. Uh, Damn, you're a dick. I, I know, but I think that's where you're going to get the most um, benefit from it, right? So with that aerobic base and – Keep turning these kids into a track club. Dude, for a, for a month-long to six-month – or a six-week phase, that's going to be ideal for me. Like if we yeah. can spend six weeks with four days a week of this LSD work, then I know for the next six months at least, I don't really have to worry about maintaining the aerobic base. Right, which they're gonna be doing through practice and through other means and modalities anyway. But if I could get a concentrated six weeks, four days a week of LSD work, I have a solid aerobic base. I'm happy with that. Yep. And so LSD work, I, I alluded to it, but I didn't explicitly say. So LSD work means I'm not doing like a fart lick with my team. We're not doing a sprint built into. This is truly just long, slow distance. And that's the difference between focusing on the aerobic base and focusing on more of like an explosion component built in, which is way more fun, but I would argue way less needed for the grappling population mm -hmm. because we need to make sure that we're developing that very robust heart. That heart is going to help us in a bunch of ways. I already alluded to it's going to get more nutrients through the system. And it's going to increase the rate at which oxygen can be sent out. But guess what it's also going to do? It's going to increase recovery as well, which is one of the key points of if I want, if I have an athlete that's having recovery issues, they're not able to get their heart rate down in between rounds or in, or in between periods. I need to make sure that their heart is as robust as possible. If they can't push as much nutrients out, if they can't push oxygen out, how in the flying fuck are they going to recover better? It can't just be breathing, right? It's not just the lungs job. It's also the heart's job. So I need to make sure that that heart is as strong as possible. That comes from this LSD running, right? It's or, or biking or any cardio that you so choose. It doesn't matter. Swimming. Swimming. But staying in that low zone for prolonged periods of time is going to make the heart stronger. And that's really what matters because it's going to do a different thing than doing power work or exploding through these, these high intensities. A high heart rate is going to train the heart in a different way than a low heart rate for prolonged periods of time. Just like doing 15 reps of an exercise is going to train your body differently than doing two reps of an exercise at a high weight. That's all that is. We got to treat the heart and train the heart like we train the rest of the system. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the aerobic work too, when you're disciplined about it, 
it's I look at it as like a you're training to be able to train. Yeah. Right. Like the aerobic work, the the LSD, like that's preparing your body to be able to handle a in camp or a in season or that constant grind you're going to be mm-hmm. under. When you can recover better and you're in better shape, you get hurt way less often. You're able to work at that higher quality more often. You're not wasting quote unquote wasting time in season trying to get in shape right if we're already in shape then we can actually work on what matters and what's going to affect you in your competition yeah excuse me versus if we have to work competitive tactical tactical sessions we have to try and peak strength and conditioning all simultaneously while i'm trying to lose weight and get in shape that shit becomes really hard and complicated and we're not doing the best that we can so Invest in this time outside of season, outside of camp, outside of your typical training periods to get an aerobic base, right? Like one of the best ways I saw implemented was you would, you know, as a team or by yourself, you would do your 30 to 60 minute run at 6 a.m. in the morning before your day starts Mm -hmm. for a good month and a half before season starts or whatever, right? Month, month and a half. It's a part of your captain's practice. Exactly. Like plan and execute that plan outside of where the actual work happens mm-hmm. because th- this to me is the bare minimum level requirement that I have of my athletes right if you cannot be in shape enough to recover in a strength and conditioning session if you're not recovering after 90 seconds that's no. not a I'm not strong issue that's not I don't like lifting weights issue that's a you're not in fucking shape issue Right. I mean, unless we're so, doing maximal expression shit. Yeah, well. Like if you're if we're doing two RMs, then you aren't recovering in ninety seconds. Your heart rate definitely should drop. In heart rate, a hundred percent. Yes. Okay. Right. You should be. You should be back. Yes, to your heart rate should definitely drop. Baseline. Maybe you won't be able to lift your two RM again in ninety seconds, yeah. but you should not be laying on the floor still. Ever. Correct. Yeah, you shouldn't be destroyed. Yeah. So. So I don't know. I th- this is one of the things that, as you could probably tell, I have a very low um, tolerance for. Right? It's like <laughs> I could tell. <laughs> you are an athlete, and this is a thing you're gonna pursue, but you're not gonna put the baseline work in to be in shape enough, or you're gonna come back from your out of camp and be so out of shape that you can't make it through practice. That yeah. does not fucking sit well with me. Well, it's um, it's like you want to be a lawyer, but you don't want to pass the bar. Like right. it's it's a requirement to do that. You you want to be a chiropractor, but you you don't get your license. Right. Like it's, like you, you, you it is a part of being an athlete. It's a part of being a high performing athlete is having that, but so many people neglect it because it's boring as fuck. Right, and it's yeah, it sucks. But and if you put um, in any other content or context of life, <laughs> people would laugh at you. Just like, so, yep. <laughs> but because it's an athlete, because there's so many different variables, they're like, oh, I could, I could breeze by that. But every other job has a component like that. It's just every other job's not as fun as being an athlete. Right. No, I, I totally agree. Um, so last piece of that for coaches, your LSD work, I, I think takes place outside of your traditional practice hours, right? Like that's. That's yeah. something like you said, team practice or team, uh, captain's runs. You can go on, you can do that. You can mandate like a team conditioning early in season. Um, but yeah, that that's for me, that's got to take place outside of our technical tactical sessions simply because it takes so long. Right. I concur. All right, dude. All right. Well, this is conditioning for wrestlers. There's a lot of me on a soapbox. Sorry, folks. Um, but if you guys got to get in touch with us, all of our information is going to be in the show notes. So that's going to be our Instagrams as well as our emails. Shoot us a message at either of those if you have any questions or if you think we're wrong or if you think we're right. We just like to hear from you. If you got to get in touch with us about a program, so if you want any sort of strength and conditioning programming, we're also going to be offering some rehab programming as well. That's coming out in Q3 of 2023 where there's going to be individualized rehab plans being available. Those are all going to be at buildingafighter.com, our pre-made programs, our membership options, as well as our custom programs. So buildingafighter.com. This is Dr. Austin Shane. Alex Freeman. And we are out.